Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, open up to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We'll be looking at the whole uh, passage this morning, but I'm only going to read to you verses 22 through 36. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 36. You can open up to page 910 in the Pew Bible if you don't have your own copy of God's Word. And as you're opening there, I just want to say how proud I am of this group behind me. We love it when you guys lead us in worship. And thank you for all the time and effort you put into uh, going on this choir tour and getting prepared for it and serving folks uh, down south. We're so thankful for that. And I'd also like to say how proud I am of Nathan. Um, he had planned on wearing a sport coat over his t-shirt with the sleeves pushed up this morning and uh, we talked him out of going Don Johnson style here today and uh, I'm going to tell you it's the hardest battle I've fought in a while but uh, we, we succeeded and we're real proud of him too. So um, if you have your Bibles open there to Acts chapter 2, why don't you uh, stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. Luke writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God Himself is speaking to us, beginning in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through Him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet... And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this debt. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Let's pray together. O God, we thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together and worship today. And oh God, I pray you would move in our hearts and minds. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I love uh, looking to, dreaming about, thinking about, praying about the future. I spend a lot of time, in fact, Whitney can, I can sometimes drive Whitney crazy planning a vacation or doing something like that. I'm, I'm almost always thinking about what's coming up next, thinking about the future, dreaming about the future. I like to dream about my kids' future, about mine and Whitney's life in the future, uh, what my grandchildren might be like. I, I dream and think about all sorts of things about the future. There are all kinds of things that make me excited for the future. In fact, one of my favorite things that I get to do here, one of my favorite parts of being your pastor and being the pastor here, is dreaming about the future of First Baptist Church. We're, we're in an exciting season in the life of our church. And I felt led uh, this summer as we finished up Samuel, as we get ready to, Lord willing, get, get started in the Gospel of Matthew later this year. Uh, over this summer, I felt led to remind us of who we are and what we're about. We're, we're looking to the future in a lot of ways as a church right now. We've got groups uh, meeting, committees meeting, looking at our facilities, studying what we will need in the future uh, in terms of what areas are, are best to renovate next. Just, there's lots going on, lots that we're thinking about. 
And so today I felt led um, to begin thinking about who we are in the midst of it. it. It's easy, it's tempting, and very easy to get sort of caught up in growing and to get caught up in the buildings and to get caught up in all those things and to miss who we are. So today I'm kicking off a nine-week sermon series called First Distinctives. Each Sunday when we're here during that time, we're going to look at what we hope to be distinguished by in the life of our church. Nearly two years ago, from the very end of this passage in Acts 2, I preached a sermon to help us think about the next decade of life at our church. It's right after my 10-year anniversary here. And that Sunday morning, I sort of laid out, and our staff's been thinking through and praying through a vision for what it might mean for us to be a gospel engine for Etowah County and beyond. That is all that God's given us. How do we see that convert into gospel impact? So we're going to go deeper into what that might look like this summer. We're going to be thinking in three categories this morning and in the weeks to come. We're going to be thinking about gospel life, gospel culture, and gospel impact in the life of First Baptist Church. This morning, we're going to look to Acts chapter 2 to get a sense of each of these categories and to think through what it might mean for us to be a gospel church, to continue to be a gospel church. I want to show you this morning three truths that I think will shape and form us as a gospel church, a, a gospel community, a gospel people. Three truths this morning. Here's the first. The Spirit builds the church's gospel culture. The Spirit builds the church's gospel culture. One of the challenges of leading in any context, but maybe especially in a church, is what we call the competition of, of competing goods. There are just so many good things to do. Any given Sunday, any given Wednesday, any given week. There are just lots of good things. You guys are learning this every day, I'm sure, right? There are competing goods in life. And say yes to one thing often means saying no uh, to another. And so there are all kinds of good things to celebrate. And on a Sunday like this, we don't get to celebrate everything we might like to celebrate. One of the things I love that Nathan does is he will often point us to what's going on in the broader church in terms of liturgical calendars. Today happens to be Pentecost Sunday. And so it's fitting that I preach from this text today. Uh, this is a day where the church historically has uh, celebrated the coming of the Holy Spirit. The sermon I just read is a sermon uh, that Peter preached on the first Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was sent. Now, we can't get in the weeds any Sunday on a passage this long, um, but especially not today, because again, there's so many good things going on. But I, I, I want to make sure that we note just a few things in verses 1 through 13. We haven't read them yet, but you, you may take my word for it for now and then read later and make sure it all checks out. But a few things I want you to note about what happens here. The day of Pentecost arrives, and they're all together in one place, in verse 1. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And then in verse 3, divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them um, utterance. One thing I want to mention is that the Spirit is sent the Spirit is sent. Did you notice there's nothing these folks did to make the Holy Spirit come? In fact, if you were to back up, Jesus has just promised before he ascended into heaven that he would send his Spirit and that his Spirit would indwell his church and that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There's a problem. Sin has so divided us, and especially in these days, that folks are not able to speak each other's languages. It's going to be really hard to take the gospel to all the ends of the earth. And so there's this beautiful picture that happens in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. It's sort of a reversal of what happened at Babel, where under the Holy Spirit and in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, people from every tribe, tongue, people from multiple tribes, tongues, languages, and nations are brought together as the Holy Spirit empowers people to speak these other languages, and they hear one another speaking the gospel, speaking and praising God in their own native tongues. It's a miracle. What happens? It's not like they asked for this. No, this is something Jesus did. He died, he raised again, he ascended into heaven, and then he sent the Holy Spirit. You can see also the way that the Spirit brings power to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
If you see Peter in the Gospels, he's a very different man in Acts chapter 2 than he is in the ends of the Gospels. Peter's just been restored and now he is preaching with power. And in the same way, the church gets power as the Holy Spirit comes on them. And you see the way that the Holy Spirit unifies the church. They begin speaking in other languages. These people who already believe in God begin speaking in other languages so they can hear one another. There's unity brought to the Lord's church. Most importantly, though, the Spirit is sent after Jesus died, rose again, and ascended. And as people see these folks speaking in tongues, they uh, begin to accuse them of being drunk. And then Peter steps up and preaches the gospel in order to make sense of what happened here. So think about this. Um, I think Luke wrote the gospel of Luke and Acts sort of together. So if you were to read these together, Jesus dies. He raises from the dead at the end of Luke. And then in Acts chapter 1, Jesus gives this commission, this Acts 1-8 commission uh, to his church. And then he sends the Holy Spirit to the church. So on the front end and the back end of the reception of the Holy Spirit and the giving of the Holy Spirit is the clarity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only in the incidentals of what happened, but on the back end, Peter interpreting the coming of the Spirit in terms of the Gospels I read just a few moments ago. Jesus himself promised this. And I think it's important for us to remember as a church that we are hopeless to build a gospel culture in our church without the help of the Holy Spirit. Everything that happens in the rest of the book of Acts, everything that happens in the rest of uh, the New Testament, everything that's happened in the years since the church has happened thanks to God sending the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Everything you see happening in the remainder of the passage in particular happens as a result of the coming of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Let me put it like this. I believe with all my heart that God's Holy Spirit, I believe He is the lifeblood of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it. We can't do anything without Christ, can we? Jesus is uh, the Lord of the church. He's over the church. He's the head of the church. But how are we united to Christ? It's by His Holy Spirit, isn't it? It's the only way we can have fellowship with God. And the Son is through, the Father and the Son is through The Holy Spirit, He unites us to Jesus. He knits us together in love. Holy Spirit works to bring unity to the church. He brings all the good gifts of God to us. Can you imagine trying to preach without the help of the Holy Spirit? Can you imagine trying to serve without the help of the Holy Spirit? Can you imagine trying to use any of the good gifts God's given us for His glory without the help of the Holy Spirit? How quickly would we give in to pride? How quickly would we break up into factions? How quickly would all these things happen if all it was about was our gifts and what we can do? But no, friends, when the Holy Spirit uses our gifts, when the Holy Spirit gives us gifts, He builds the church up. The Holy Spirit gives life and power to our preaching, to our evangelism, to our witnessing. He is at work, in fact, in every one of our hearts to enable us to love and serve and obey God. Every day, every time you obey God, it's by the help of the Holy Spirit. Friends, there's nothing we can do here that we, there's nothing that would be done here that we can't, that we can do without the help of the Holy Spirit. We must be a spirit-enabled church if we're going to have a gospel culture here. And later in this series, we'll flesh out a little more about what a gospel culture would look like in a church. But just know this, if the gospel of Jesus is going to permeate what we do as a church, we need the Holy Spirit's help. Second of all, not only does the Spirit, builds the church's, does the Spirit build the church's gospel culture, but second of all, Gospel proclamation creates gospel impact. Gospel proclamation creates gospel impact. This is one of my favorite moments in the Bible. You've probably heard me say before, I identify uh, pretty closely oftentimes with the Apostle Peter of the Gospels. Um, He is oftentimes uh, getting on out ahead of himself a little bit. Uh, with his mouth, for that matter. And uh, if you've spent much time with me, you know I, I can do that sometimes. And uh, uh, he is oftentimes uh, 
um, speaking before he thinks, he's oftentimes sort of being impetuous and impatient and trying to get after some things. And so I love coming around. I mean, it's like this Peter's Pentecost sermon's like, man, thank, thank you, Lord, that you can use somebody like that, you know, because uh, it hopefully means you can use someone like me is, is sort of how I feel as he's preaching. But I want you to see some characteristics of gospel proclamation in this sermon that Peter preaches. First of all, you can see it's gospel-centered. It's gospel-centered. One thing I've noticed is a lot of times movements, gospel movements, can get sidetracked. They can become focused on the other stuff more than they're focused on the gospel. Um, I think this is one of the challenges that the modern Pentecostal movement has had to wrestle with and struggle with a little bit is that there are aspects of that movement that have gotten become so preoccupied with the gifts that it feels like they've missed what the gifts are meant to point to, and that's the gospel. It's easy for the gospel to get eclipsed. Don't, don't think for a second that it can't get eclipsed in our tradition. I'm just picking on uh, the uh, Pentecostals. The same sort of thing can happen in our churches as well. But all of these things, Peter says, you can see how this coming of the Holy Spirit could have been treated just sort of like a sideshow. People are glorifying God, but then when people start to say, oh, this is silly, these are just folks that are drunk, what happens? But Peter begins to preach to all these folks, including the mockers. Right? And he begins to declare that the signs, the wonders, the miracles, all of these things, Peter relentlessly points to the fact that they point to what Jesus has done. I, I read it for you uh, earlier. That's in verses 14 through 21. You, you, you could see, well, I didn't read those. 14 through 21, Peter, he stood with the eleven. He lifted up his voice and he addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk as you suppose. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. He begins to talk about this prophecy. And then he says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs. He begins to walk through all of what Jesus did. He died. He rose again. He's pointing them to the fact that this sign of the Holy Spirit, this work of God, this miracle is meant to point them to the gospel. Faithful gospel proclamation is not only gospel-centered, but it's also rooted in the person and work of Christ. Friends, we, we cannot preach unless we preach the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our, our gospel proclamation must be rooted in who Jesus is. But Peter talks about these miracles that attested to who Jesus was. He, he says clearly he is a man as well. So he's a testifying here to the fact that he is fully God and fully man. He, in verse 23, testifies to the fact that the person and work of Christ all were occurring according to God's sovereign plan. And then, of course, you can't preach the gospel. You, you can't preach faithfully without focusing on the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see how Peter says it in verses 23 and 24? This Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. But you crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Friends, faithful gospel proclamation must be rooted in the person and work of Christ, and it can never bypass the death and resurrection of Jesus. But also, faithful gospel proclamation must be based on the whole counsel of God. Do you see that Peter then begins to uh, talk about David? If you've ever wondered why in the world did uh, the pastor spend this much time in First and Second Samuel talking about the life of David? So it was over and over and over again. One reason why is that the New Testament authors are regularly making references back to David when they talk about Christ. And so I believe all of the Bible points to Jesus. That's our goal. Do you see what he says here? He, he says, David says to him, says, For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. But then he says to them in verse 29, The patriarch David both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, he testified about the coming resurrection of the Christ. He's showing the way the whole counsel of God points to what God is doing in the gospel. But then you see what happens. 
When we faithfully proclaim the gospel, it produces gospel impact. Verses 37 through 41, it's amazing. They heard this and they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you. And so he, with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. See what happens? Jesus died, Jesus dies, Jesus raises again, the Holy Spirit empowers the church, the gospel's proclaimed, and then people's lives are impacted with the gospel. Thousands of people get saved when the gospel's preached here. here. Here's the reality, friends. If we want to reach our city, if we want to change the culture, you know, we're worried about all that's going on in the world. If we want to be a gospel engine that produces gospel impact, before any of that happens, we must be gospel proclaimers. We must be gospel proclaimers. Now listen, I want you to know, I have dedicated my life to proclaiming the gospel through my preaching ministry here. It's important, but it's not the only important way that the gospel gets proclaimed in the life of the church. Right? Right? There are all kinds of other, if we just think that all that we do, if you just hear, hey, we need to be gospel proclaimers, and you just think, well, Brother Matt's got that. He preaches every Sunday. Now listen, I'm a, I'm a, I have a high view of preaching. Don't, don't mishear me. But, but listen, friends, brothers, sisters, I, I also do important gospel proclamation work outside the church when I encounter people who need to know Jesus. You do important gospel proclamation work when you encounter people outside our church who need to know Jesus. You do important gospel proclamation work when you teach Sunday school. You do important gospel proclamation work when you volunteer for vacation Bible school or when you volunteer for McSpadden and you love and serve children. Friends, brothers, sisters, when you rock a baby in the nursery and whisper John 3.16 in their ear, you are doing important gospel proclamation work in the life of the church. Do you see this? If we're going to be a gospel engine that produces gospel impact, we must be gospel proclaimers. But finally... Not only does gospel proclamation produce gospel impact, but finally, healthy churches live out gospel life. We live out a gospel life. I I love this last section of Acts chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul. Notice what they devoted themselves to. First of all, to the apostles' teaching. That is, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching through, first of all, reading the scriptures that the apostles refer to. I believe this includes reading the Old Testament. If you're going to hear what the apostles have to teach already, we see Peter teaching from the Old Testament here. So they're committed to the Word. Later, there are letters that come from the apostles that they study and read aloud in church that are scripture as well. But then also, that means they're attending church. Now, at this point, they seem to be attending and gathering together in the temple. I I think they're also gathering together on the Lord's Day. Very early, that's happening. And devoting themselves in that way to the apostles' teaching. But they're also committed not only to that, but they're committed to the fellowship. That is being a part of the body of believers that they were local to. So here, it's a small group at this point. It's a growing group, but they're committed to the fellowship. They're committed to the breaking of bread. I, I think that's a a reference not only to the fellowship they might have around the table, but also to the Lord's Supper, to being part of the gathered local church. And they're devoted to prayer. They're devoted to prayer. Now, these, this devotion, I want you to see what it results in. What they're doing, this, they're, they're living out a gospel life, right? They're, they're living out a life according to the gospel, and it results in gospel life in the, law, in the life of the church. It says that they had all of God. It says that mighty works were being done through the apostles. Verses 44 and 45 paint a picture of radical generosity to one another and to others. We see a picture of thankfulness. They're giving hearts, giving thanks to God in their hearts. And we see a picture of worship where they're praising the Lord Jesus. They have favor with the people. And then daily people are being added to their number. People are being saved. Do you see this? 
People, people write books on church growth all the time, right? People write books. People say, I've got the secret. People, uh, I'll, I'll never forget when I, when I first became a pastor, I mean, it was my pet peeve. Every time um, I would see somebody that I hadn't seen in a while, they'd say, how's church going? I'd say, it's going pretty well. And they'd say, is it growing? And I would say, growing in grace, you know. Yeah, we're growing, growing in the Lord. Growing in all the ways that God will give us to grow. But everybody thinks that you need a good pastor, or you need a good plan, or you need this special book, or you need to do this, or you need to do that. Here, here's the reality, folks. If, if we want to see our churches grow, especially in a world that's rapidly changing, the best thing we can do is live out the life of the gospel in our church. There's no special formula. It's pretty simple. Go to church, focus on the gospel, read the word, pray. <laughs> Be in awe of God. Pray, break bread together, take the Lord's Supper, practice radical generosity, see God work and change lives, worship, be thankful. And then God gives favor with the people and God gives converts. Friends, gospel life leads to a healthy church. I want to say this. I love looking forward to the future. I love thinking about where you guys are going to be in the future. I love thinking about that. I love thinking about where our church is going to be in the future. And I, I believe in the future of First Baptist Church. My hope and my prayer, and in fact it's my belief, is that 169 years from now, First Baptist Church will be a gospel church just like she was 169 years ago when she started, 1855. But right now, what we do is we continue to live by the Word and the Spirit in order that we might live a gospel life, in order that we might have a gospel culture, and that by God's grace, He will continue to give us gospel impact. And friends, in all this, God will continue to bless First Baptist Church in order that we might be a gospel church. That's our hope, and that's our prayer. I want to offer an invitation this morning. If you've never put hope and trust in Christ, I, I want to encourage you this morning um, that uh, if you've never been converted, if you've never been saved, Jesus stands ready to save you. Uh, you. You've heard the gospel. You know what Jesus did for you. He died for your sins, was raised from the dead. God stands open with arms open wide, ready to save you. I believe if you turn from your sins and repentance and turn to God in faith through Jesus, I I believe you will be saved. If you need someone to talk to, I'll be standing down front this morning, or you can do business with the Lord right where you are. Second of all, you may be a believer. You may say, Pastor, I, I just need some time to pray. I need to do some business with the Lord this morning. Right where you are, you can do that. Right here, if you want to come talk to me, you can. If you just want to come to the altar symbolically, it's open for you this morning. And finally, you may be looking for a church home. Can't promise you we're a perfect church, but I can say this. It's our commitment to be and to continue to be a gospel church. I'd love to talk to you this morning about what it means for you to be a member here at First Baptist. After this prayer, I want to invite you to come. Let's pray together.